pray that you have your Bibles open with you this morning as we approach one of the most incredible, glorious passages of all Scripture, which is John 3.16. And before we get into it, for years I've been desiring to jump into the Gospel of John it was eight years ago that I came to a theological crux in my life, a, a theological crisis per se, and the book of John, the gospel of John has really, at that moment, helped put a lot of things into perspective, a lot of preconceived uh, notions that I had before coming to Christ and even during my, my Christian walk, if, if, if I could even call it that. A lot of things began to fall into place as, we, as I began to dive into the Gospel of John. And so ever since then, it's been seven years, eight, seven years that, that one day I was seeking to preach through the Gospel of John. And the, the moments have come during these past months and specifically on the Gospel's major verse, John three sixteen. This is the verse that we've all become very familiar with, a verse that we see all over media, a verse that we see tattooed across the chest of athletes, on the arms, on the shoes, on t-shirts, bumper stickers, you name it, it's been there. Even famous wrestlers substituted their names for this verse. It's, it's incredible to see the amount of knowledge about the verse, but not profound understanding of it. And so this morning, as, as we begin to speak on it and, and teach through it, I want to be very careful not to pass it over in a simple sense. Because it is so well known and because it's so popular and it's one of the most known verses even amongst uh, people that don't come to church, I'm pretty sure you can say it by memory off the top of your head as you sit there. Your children might even know this verse by the time they're seven, eight years old and might be in their memory already. Because it is so familiar, I want to make sure that we understand this. It's not just something that we can repeat by memory, but it is something that sustains us during our moments of crisis. This in itself is a verse that contains the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the summary of the entire Bible. That's why the famous reformer Luther called this the miniature Bible in one verse. It is so important for us to really understand the depths of this verse because he presents to us the gospel of Jesus Christ that presents to us the summary of what it means to be a Christian, what we believe, and what God has done for us. If you were to sit down with your unbelieving friend that may not come to church or may be distant from God, we can teach them through this verse, not just a repetitive, familiarized, memorized verse, but we can teach and preach the gospel to them. It shows us the grandeur. It shows us the mega love of Jesus Christ through God the Father. It presents to us a picture of God. Who is God? We see him in John 3.16. And so for this reason, friends, we're going to embark on this long, tedious, painstaking journey where we will leave no stone unturned in order for us to get to what this message is really all about. So that every sinner can hear the gospel this morning. And it's the gospel for you and it's the gospel for me. What we've learned up until this point in time in John's gospel is a very detailed approach to the person 
of Jesus Christ. We've learned throughout first the first chapter of John who Jesus Christ is. It's a Christological approach. It's a, it's a very doctrinal approach to the gospel of John. That's why I love it so much. It presents to us who Jesus Christ is. In, in, in the last verses of, uh, or the beginning verses of John 3, we got to see the Holy Spirit at work and in the wind, as Jesus calls it, and in this process of regeneration in the life of Nicodemus as Jesus presents to him the gospel gospel in that way. But now, friends, we're coming to a point in time where for the first time in the gospel of John, our, our, our attention will soar up into heaven and will get us to see who God is and what he does. This, my friends, is what we call theology. Now, when we say that word, it's, 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 very, it's rather foreign to us in the sense that we only consider it as a learning experience, something that abides in our head, something that we approach the Bible with technically. But no, theology doesn't affect our minds alone. It affects our hearts. Theology is the study of God. It is knowing God. It is learning about God. And that's why we are all theologians, because we all know or believe something about God, whether it be a good thing or a bad thing. But theology affects the heart. It affects the person to its core being. What we know about God will sustain us at every moment in our lives. And that's why it's so important to come to John 3.16 with this wonderful open heart and open mind to understand the profound depths of this glorious God. It is God who is given to us. It is God who gives to us love and his son. So at the very beginning, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the entire verse. And then throughout these weeks, we're going to come back to the verse and dissect it piece by piece. One, possibly one word at a time so that we could really get to the depths of this verse. If it's the most famous verse in the world, if it's the most famous verse even amongst your friends... I believe that you should know what this verse says and especially its meaning. So without further ado, let's open up our Bibles and go back to that single verse. The e, I'm going to read it in the ESV translation and then we're going to adjust some words as we move forward. But the word of God says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. That he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What I love about the ESV, as well as other literal translations, is that it puts God at the beginning of the verse. God is front and center and end. He is the beginning. Everything about redemption history starts with God. We are embarking upon a verse that teaches us the depths of salvation of what God has done for us, what God has done for you, the sinner, what God is doing for us now. And it starts with God. And so because some of these words are very interesting, we can also translate this verse in this way. For God loved the world in this way. The Greek word, I don't want to get too much into Greek grammar this morning because it will lose the essence of who God is. But the grammar constructs a qualitative sense rather than a quantitative sense. So the ESV says, for God so loved the world. In a sense, God's great love is expressed there. But the Greek is a little bit more literal and a little bit more clear. Greek really means a, quali a, a, quantitative, a qualitative way when it gathers our attention towards how God expresses his love. And so what we get is God loves the world in this way. What way is that, you may ask? We'll get to that in a bit. But the beginning is very important. For God, 
God begins redemption story. He is at the beginning of our salvation. He accomplishes salvation. He sustains our, us in our salvation. And he is the fulfillment of our salvation. We cannot get away of this fact. God saves. As we, we belabored the point last week, God is the one who saves us. And we are fulfilled in him. The next attribute we see in God, or the first attribute we see in God, is presented with the very next word, agape, love. What does God do? God loves. What does God love? What does love do? Give. This love attribute will be discussed in much greater detail as we dissect this verse more and more, but we are shown love by the actions of God. This is clear to the writers of uh, the writer of Romans, the Apostle Paul, when he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The love of God is expressed through actions. God is demonstrating this consistently. When the grammar presents a past event, it's also implying an event that keeps going. It's at one point in time that keeps on going. It wasn't that God just loved back then. It's that God keeps loving. God loves the sinner. God demonstrates this love through actions. We don't merit God's love or we don't win him over. The world wasn't compelling towards God or winning God's attention. It wasn't anything that God saw in the world that caused him to look down and say, wow, I'm really going to love them. It was in his nature to do so. It is who he is to do so, to love it is not just an emotional, affectionate, or a feeling-driven love. It is a love of action because that's who God is. That is his nature. How does he love? Verse 16 replies, in this way. I mentioned a little bit what that means. It's qualitative. This is how God loves. This is how God demonstrates his love. How does he do so? Well, it points us back to verse 15. You remember what verse 15 says? That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In who? Go back to verse 14. At the end of verse 14, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What this love and how he's doing it points us to is at the cross. The way God loves, how he demonstrates his love is by the lifting up of his son. Is by the lifting up of Christ to express salvation to a dying world. A world in sin. How does God save? By the raising of this son. Now we got to answer, ask another question. Who does he love? Well, the verse answers that for us. Who's the object of God's love? Verse 16 says, the world. Now this is going to be a very, very important topic to discuss. Here is just a summary of what we will be expressing, and we're going to go into much further detail as the weeks go on. But the object of God's love is the world. This is interesting because it's juxtaposed next to God the Son. The way God loves his Son, he demonstrates it towards the world in different ways. 
The world is the object of, of God's love. This is the world, the one that he created, the one that he formed, the one that we saw in John chapter 1, that the son was involved as well. The world that God created, the world that God formed, the world that God decided to bring into existence, the very world that rejected him, pushed him away, and hates him. This world is the one that he loves. Before we came to Christ, many of us Christian brothers and sisters, we wouldn't say that we hated the world, but separate from God and loving the things that we were doing, we were enemies of God. We hated God by our actions. And so this is the world that God loves. When you juxtapose that with his love for Christ, it becomes that much more grand. The way God loves his son is expressed to a world that hates him. How does this work? How, is this, and how does this make any sense? Friends, this is God, and we will never understand how this makes sense. Because God's mind is nothing like our own. The world is the object of his of his love. This isn't a narrow view of salvation, redemption, history. In the context of Nicodemus, the Jewish leader, Nicodemus would have been used to hearing that for God loved the nation of Israel in this way, or for God loved the, the, the chosen people of Israel in this way, or God loved the sons of Abraham in this way, or God loved the believers in the Torah in this way. The, the Jewish person like Nicodemus would have been used to God loving a specific group. But the view opens wide here. It isn't just the Jewish people that God loves. Jesus doesn't bring the context of God's love once more to a select group. It is everyone. It is the Jew and the Gentile, the Greek, it is everyone who exists in no particular race that has no particular merit. Everyone is now included into this object, into this love. So it's not a narrow view. Now we ask the question, what, what has been given to the world? We read back in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God loved the world in this way that he gave his unique son. This word monogenes, it, it expresses, we, we spoke about this in John chapter 1, it expresses the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. It isn't one of many, it is only one of a kind. What God gives a world that hates him is his unique, one-of-a-kind son. This son will accomplish a one-of-a-kind work. Only a unique, only a one-of-a-kind uh, entity, only the son within the Godhead, within the Trinity, could accomplish this only mediatorial work. Only... Jesus could be Savior. Only Jesus could offer a perfect sacrifice. Only Jesus could be sufficient. Only Jesus could accomplish his role. That's why he is unique. And that's why there are no others besides Jesus. That's why there isn't many ways to salvation. That's why there aren't many different theologies to get to heaven or to be saved or to be made right with God. That's why it isn't pluralistic. It's singular. It's one. It's a unique way. And the way is Jesus Christ. Friends, come to Jesus because there is no other way towards salvation. There is nothing else you can do 
to be saved other than believing in God's unique son. Only his unique son can uniquely wash away your sin. No one else could do that. No one else was designed to do that. No one else can fulfill that. Only Jesus. And so he is what is given to the world. He is the only Savior. And what's the purpose behind all of this? If you go back to verse 16, that whoever, the Jew, the Greek, the Gentile, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The summary, then, is God's plan of salvation to a world that hates him by giving of a unique son, a son who would obey when the world would disobey, a son who would stand in the gap, a unique son as opposed to an angel or an archangel or an Old Testament prophet, a unique son who would accomplish salvation on behalf of a sinful world. That's why this is a miniature Bible. That's why this is the gospel summed up in one verse. For everyone out there who is in sin, who is living in sin, if you are a sinner this morning, which is the grand majority of the people, the Bible says we are all sinners. The Bible teaches us that we have all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You and I are sinners. And the only way to be saved is to believe in God's unique Son, Jesus Christ. For eternal life. For the rescue of God's, or from the rescue of God's wrath. And that's why this perishing isn't just an extinction, isn't just a moment of death and that's it. It is eternal perishing, eternal death juxtaposed with eternal life in Christ. It's forever. Those who reject the Son, reject the Father, and will suffer the consequence of living in eternal anguish. The gospel is real, my friends. And many have at this point turned away and have been turned off by God and have tried to manipulate and reinterpret what Scripture means. God can't possibly send anyone to hell. That's not God's nature. God is love. You just said it yourself. Well, friends, because God loves, God is faithful and just. And it is in his loving holiness and justice that those who have rejected him will die eternally. We'll get to that when we get there. But friends, this is a moment as all of Scripture calls out and cries out for every single person here. I'm glad you tuned in. I'm glad you're watching. Maybe someone forced you to watch and listen. You may never have wanted to come to church, especially watch church online. But this, my friends, is the message God has for you. If you are dead in your sin, you can only be made alive in Christ. Come to Jesus. Know your Savior Know who he is. We're about to celebrate Easter Sunday. Why will we be celebrating a man that died on the cross? What does this mean? Friends, we are anticipating this. And we, and we with all of our hearts, cry out for you to run to Jesus. Because there's nothing else in this world that can be offered to you for your sin or for salvation of sin. You are not good enough. And you will never be. But Christ is good. And he has suffered the consequence for our sin. So friends, as we begin to discuss in much more detail this wonderful, glorious, weighty, heavy verse, you'll understand that everything starts with God. And that is why, as we mentioned earlier, earlier, 
It's a theological concept that doesn't just affect our heads, but goes straight to the person, to our heart. During this grand pandemic of COVID-19, everyone has seemed to become a theologian. And it's true because everyone is and has an inner theologian. Everyone at some point in time, Christian or not, has somehow managed to say the words, God is in control. They've understood something about that. God is in control. A lot of pastors have been saying this. We have said it. God is in control. This is a theological concept that stems from this verse. God is the one in charge of planning. God has planned. God has designed. God has formed. God has put into action everything that is going on. And though we can say God is in control, it is seldom that we understand what that means. John 3.16 begs us to know this God and what he has done. Therefore, let's begin with God. If redemption was all planned out, it says something about who God is. And that's what John 3.16 reminds us about. It's the redemption plan. Who put it into effect? And and who planned it? Who's the one that designed it? Who is the one who formed this? The Word of God answers this with a clear indication for God. Loved in this way. God is the one who who designs. So in verse 16, the second word that is mentioned is theos, God. We start here as we start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is some depth to that that we have to bring our minds to understand. God creates. God decrees. The concept that we're going to be exploring at this moment is the decree of God or God's divine decree. So we'll explain that a little bit more as we move forward. But as we know God, immediately we understand him at the basis of creation, what he has done, what he has created. At one point in time, if we have our notion of time, God decided to create the world and yet did not withdraw from his creation. See, God created heaven and and earth. And if John 3.16 is correct, which we believe it is, God also created before our time the salvation, redemption story. The narrative of salvation. Your life was placed in order before you even existed. He exercises his providential control over the world. And God acts within our space and time. This is a concept that we must come to understand if we look at the Bible with an open spiritual heart. This is theology, my friends, and that's why it's front and center at John 3.16. This is God, and God decrees, and God puts in place, and God plans. If this is not the case, if God doesn't create, or if God doesn't get involved with his creation, then God can't intervene, and God can't do anything about his salvation, or his people to bring them salvation. If God does create and withdraws, we have no Savior and we have no hope. But God does come in and does act within his creation. So does God then act according to his plan Or does God act depending on what he sees unfold? Basically, 
In layman's terms, does God wing it? Does God ever get surprised? Does God say, well, let's see how this will all turn out at the end? Friends, that's not who God is. God has set in motion everything in existence. God would not create a universe that he had not planned to make in the first place. He would not send a savior and call a people to himself without previously deciding to do so. God decides. God plans. And at the heart of John 3.16, we have this God in motion. This God in action. This God involved. His hands are involved in creation. In sending of his son, God Emmanuel abiding within man to save his people. So what does this decree mean? What is the concept of a decree? What is God's divine decree? In this case, it isn't a vocal proclamation as a king would do or as a monarch would do when he decrees something over his people. You should do this or this is what we've been doing or like the governors have been doing lately and the president by making this stay at home into effect. It isn't an authorial decree. Decree in this sense means God's eternal purpose. The decisions that he has concerning what will happen in the universe. What he decided makes actions and events certain. Basically, God's decree is God's decision to do whatever he wants in his created order. To understand this, we have to go back to the word of God. And we have to get this picture from the Old Testament and from the New. We can't just make things up about God. We have to see it within Scripture because it brings weight to these first words in John 3.16. It isn't just a, a, a memorized concept that for God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son for that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's just not the, that's not the point of John 3.16. The point of John 3.16 is finding what's at the beginning and deepening our thought on who that person is and what he has done. God has decided, friends, to save us. God has decided to save you. And if you're anything like me, the greatest question is, why would God want to save someone like me? And that speaks on his grace and that speaks on his love. But the fact is, he decided to do so. I didn't manipulate God to save me. I didn't twist his arm. I didn't make him tap. I couldn't. God had already done so before I even existed. Let's look at some Old Testament passages, my friends. Keep your Bibles open. I like doing this a lot more as we're online because you can really open your Bible and, and, if, and if you're embarrassed to find the, the, the verse, you can actually go through the, to the table of contents and no one's going to judge you because you're at home and maybe your kids will judge you, but, but the rest, I mean, it should be fine. Sometimes here at church, we don't even want to open our Bibles because we don't know where the books are. But look at Psalm chapter 33. This intellectual element of God's decision-making is evident in the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 33 Verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart are to all generations. Now go with me to Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah, chapter 32. Verse 19. And to help you all, we'll put some of these verses on the screen. Great in counsel and mighty indeed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the children of man, rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. 
what, what's at play here, friends, is that God's decision making isn't arbitrary. This is a concept that we've been presenting ever since we've opened up the Gospel of John. It, it's not God just, just pulling it from the air and just saying, okay, today I'm going to do this, or I'm just going to make this person suffer, and I'm going to make that person rich, and I'm going to do that. It, it's not God arbitrarily deciding what to do. It's within his counsel. There is a, 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 a understanding, a, a, an element of reason that is embedded in everything God does. And everything God does, my friends, is good because it's God. What we do can be qualified. Sometimes we act according to our, our good nature. Sometimes we act according to our evil nature. Not everything that humanity does is good. And it's pretty self-evident within our marriage and within our household that sometimes we do evil things. God is nothing like us in that sense. God is God. And what God does, he does with a reason. And God's reasoning is always good. Another aspect of this decree and decision-making by God is that his purpose, his determining fact has a purpose. What God decides to do and the motion he puts into existence has a purpose. So his decision-making is purposeful. Again, it's not arbitrary. Go back to Psalm. We'll see this in the book of Psalm. Psalm chapter 139 says this in verse 16. Your eyes saw me, saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me when as yet there were none of them. Even before existence, God shaped and formed everything about that person for a particular purpose. This is what God does in his decision making. That's why those babies in the wombs are so precious to God. Because he has purpose for them. This concept isn't only evident in the Old Testament. It's also evident in the New Testament. God has planned on the basis of counsel and deliberation within the Godhead, within the Trinity. God acts and has counsel to do what he does. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7. Because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to his heirs of the promise, he guaranteed it with an oath. This is his guarantee. He has an unchangeable purpose for all of his creation. This decree is also evident in the New Testament on the aspect of his will or his volition, who he is. Go back to Ephesians. Very popular verse in Ephesians chapter 1 when we read in verse 11, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. What God does, my friends, again, happens at the counsel of his will. It isn't our advice. It isn't what we could do to manipulate his mind. It isn't anything within creational substance that can bring forth a new decision in the Godhead. It is God in his volition and will that makes things happen. And in the case of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, it is for our salvation. Once more, God's decree involves a masterful plan. 
Last verse in the New Testament that we'll discuss on this is in Matthew. The first book of the New Testament, chapter 11. Show your kids how fast you can turn there because you know your Bible back and forth. Matthew chapter 11, verse 26. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. This plan and purpose was to bring God pleasure, was to have at the heart of everything that he did pleasure. Now, what does this mean? It means that the outworking of God's plans are good, good enough to make him smile, good enough to make him happy. Now, those are are human anthropological concepts and emotions, but we can't understand God in any other way than him condescending himself to us and making him evident the way we are. He is happy. He He is delighted in his will, and everything that happens according to his plan brings him delight for his good pleasure. This is what God does. And so friends, even in redemption history, even in salvation history, since we're speaking on John chapter 316, even in this aspect of God, it was his designing and his masterful plan that was placed into motion. Look at Acts. Acts chapter 2, the early church with the first preacher, Peter, understood this concept. Acts chapter 2, verse 23, Peter says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Do you get the weight of that? If God purposely designed and put into effect salvation history, and we just read in Matthew that everything that God does brings him pleasure, is for the good of of the nation that would bring him pleasure, for the good of humanity that would bring him pleasure, then that means that what Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, that it brought God pleasure to crucify his son. Read that again with me. This Jesus delivered up. You hear that word there? Delivered. Delivered up according to, To what? I want you to say it right there at your home. According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This salvation, redemption history was designed by God. The prophet Isaiah says the exact same thing in Isaiah chapter 53. This is God's doing. This is God's outworking. And it brings him pleasure because it involves the salvation of his creation. Everything God plans is predetermined. Even, my friends, salvation. Go to 1 Peter. I want to keep stressing this with Scripture. I don't want to bring any theological understanding on this. I want you to see this in Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of the Lamb without blemish or spot. Listen to this. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Jesus was for you. Jesus dies for you as it was 
planned as God decided to do so. God, in this, not only plans his death of his son, but also plans his purpose. In Ephesians, you may not have time to turn there, but Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to, as adopted sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Go skip to verse 10. As a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. In him we have also received an inheritance because we are predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. Friends, God's dying, saving act in Christ was for the purpose of you. That's the purpose. That's the design to bring you and me back into the fold of God. So we start off in John 3, 16, for God. And this is what God does. He saves the sinner because it was planned to do so in Jesus Christ. God saves us through Jesus, because he decided to do so. It was never going to be because we twisted his arm. It was, it was going to be because he designed it for us. Now, friends, we'll leave it there. And like I said, we will take a detailed approach to John 3.16. But I want to make sure that you understand that you, you get the weight of God's glory here. And friends, before we close... There's also sad news. As you're well aware, this is the first Sunday of the month, and, and we usually celebrate the Lord's Supper. We come together as a church to celebrate the Lord's Supper and what Christ has done in what was, in what was his plan and purpose. And so the church here, friends, isn't in this building we are not gathered. We are in exile. We are scattered. We are separated. The body isn't united. And so, friends, I wrote a brief article on our website, and I hope you can find it. I think we're going to place it on Facebook in a little bit, but read that because it's a detailed description of why we won't be celebrating the supper. The, the supper was for the church in the context of a church. It is within the sharing of the cup and the sharing of the elements that the church realized what was done for them. And though we can do that in our home, it loses the essence of why it was done as a family, why it was done as a church family in the body of Christ. So we mourn this aspect, my friends. We, we are in mourning for this. We are in lament. We are hurting for this. For we know that the, the, the supper, the elements of God is present. Jesus Christ is spiritually present in the elements. And he feeds us and he nourishes us and he sustains us. But at the moment, through this time of fasting, we will have to withhold and deep, have a deep down inside cry out to God to say, how long will this be, Father? But until then, my friends, when we gather again, we will have at the front and center the elements and the supper to celebrate as God's people once more. For now, we must go through this with pain and suffering, but keeping hope alive. We love you. We are praying for you, and we hope that, that God is sustaining you. We know God is sustaining you through this moment. So, friends, let's pray and finish this time together. Thank you, Father, for providing us with your word, for reminding us of who you are. And though we are scattered, and though we are not united, and we cannot take the supper, we remember what you have done. And, Lord, we... Anticipate the reunion of your bride. 
We anticipate the, the warmth of the fellowship of the koinonia once more. But Father, our prayer is for all of those out there who haven't realized that that body and blood that we were about to celebrate was for them, was for the church, and was for the future church that would be saved through the preaching of the gospel. Pray for everyone out there, Lord, that has listened to this, that has been hearing their, their friends, their family members speak to them about Christ. I pray that you bring them to your fold. Pray that you open up their eyes, open up their hearts, and bring them to salvation. In Jesus' name. And we all say, Amen. Thank you.